Okay, I'm not going to waste your time explaining to you what an iceberg image is. You've probably already seen them all over the internet, and you already know why they're kind of so popular. But for the slightly uninitiated, these are basically just lists of topics that are sorted in obscurity, with the top level stuff being most well known and the bottom level stuff being least well known. This particular iceberg image happened to come from the Sonic the Hedgehog archive on Twitter, which every single entry on this iceberg is something that is discussed on the Twitter account, and a lot of it is very well researched. So pretty much everything on this list is real, so far as we know. There could be some elaborate hoaxes in here, but as far as I can tell, Every single entry on this list is real. None of these are jokes. None. So, I've already probably talked for a bit too long in this intro. Let's just jump right into it. Genocide City, or Cyber City, was a cut zone from Sonic 2. According to Tom Payne, a level artist for the game, the zone was to be a graphical change of Metropolis Zone, but was dropped before any levels were in the game, though Metropolis Act 3 is reportedly the only level that made it into the game. As for the name, they wanted to use something that sounded threatening in English, but it was ultimately changed to Cyber City before being dropped. Deke Entertainment was an animation company that made several cartoons back in the 80s and 90s before being folded into Cookie Jar Group in 2004. Some of their more well-known cartoons were adaptations of video games, namely the Super Mario Bros. Super Show from 1989, Captain N from 89 to 91, though the three that are important to this list are The Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog from 1993, Sonic Sat AM from 93 and 94, and Sonic Underground from 99. I'd argue only two of these shows are good. Guess which one isn't? A recently discovered 1992 prototype of Sonic CD revealed that at one point in development, Palm Tree Panic, the game's first zone, was instead going to be named Salad Plain. For the most part, there are only some graphical changes and proof the game clearly wasn't finished yet, though the level design has stayed remarkably the same. Apart from Act 1, because it's missing that bit. Ah yes, the infamous Sonic Extreme. Anyone who's done even just a bit of research into the series has probably heard of this one. Long story short, it was a game planned to be released sometime in 1996 on the Sega Saturn to compete with Super Mario 64 and Crash Bandicoot. The game was to be a 3D platformer with this weird fisheye lens look. Or so this footage would have you believe. Yeah, the development and eventual cancellation of Sonic Extreme is a very long and complicated story, and I don't really have the time, patience, or research to really go into it in this video. If you're really that interested, well, there are plenty of documentaries about it here on YouTube and I suggest you go look at some when you're done here. Yeah, I'm not surprised this is this far up. The Tokyo Toy Show demo was the first time the public ever got to see the original Sonic, and apart from a few screenshots, there's not much we can really take away from it. The only other thing we really know about it is that a copy was supposedly stolen. However, I can't verify if this was true or not, but who knows? Maybe it's out there somewhere, sitting in a forgotten storage unit or something, collecting dust. Maybe we'll find it someday. Maybe. Everyone knows about these. Sonic CD's hidden sound test can bring you to one of a few hidden screens with the correct combination of music and sound effects. The first depicts Tails holding a pair of goggles standing next to a Lotus 7 with the text See You Next Game possibly foreshadowing the upcoming Sonic Drift. The image was also signed by Judy Totoya, or Yasushi Yamaguchi, Tails' character designer. The next features Sonic with big gray eyes with the text You're Too Cool, written in Japanese, signed Senchanzu, better known as Masahiro Sanpai. 
one of the game's visual designers and animation visual director. There's this semi-bizarre Batman tribute done by Takumi Miyake, a landscape and visual designer. There's the DJ scene depicting Sonic, Robotnik, and Metal Sonic all getting funky on a Friday night, signed KH, short for Kazuyuki Hoshino, a character, special stage, and visual designer, as well as illustrator. Then, of course, we have the infamous, infinite fun Sega Enterprises image, signed by Mazin, not Majin, referring to Masato Nishimura, landscape designer. On the topic of Nishimura, he later stated that the image was never meant to frighten players or be an anti-piracy screen. The inherent creepiness came with the US boss theme, which replaced the more upbeat and fun Japanese boss theme. I still don't understand why they changed the soundtrack for the US. Despite these being separate entries, I'm grouping these together. Sega World was an international series of arcade venues with locations in the UK, Australia, Taiwan, South Korea, China, and of course, Japan. Today, only a few locations remain, all of which are in Japan. Let's focus on London first. Opening the 7th of September 1996, it was the first of Sega's indoor theme parks at the time to operate outside of Japan, as well as the largest in the world at that time, and became their flagship European venue. The location had many issues with cash flow, and just three years after opening, Sega pulled out, then was rebranded as Funland in February 2000, was downsized in September 2002, and permanently closed the 4th of July 2011. Sega World Sydney is a far more remarkable story, as it was the only one in Australia, and anything related to its branding is extremely expensive today. Remind me to buy up as much branded stuff when Joy Polis eventually opens in the US. I'm not gonna miss out this time on account of not existing. Sega World Sydney opened March 18th, 1997, and was the last of its kind internationally. The venue had an almost constant trouble with visitor numbers, and after hopes of improvement from the 2000 Summer Olympics never materialized, the venue closed in November of that year, little more than three years after opening. The complex was later demolished in November of 2008. Back in 1993, Sega decided to sponsor the Williams F1 team during the 1993 Formula One World Championship. They put out some merchandise, slapped their branding on the cars, and put up some advertisements. They did this for a few years, with a few different teams in a few different series. I guess it only makes sense. Sonic is closely associated with speed, and you can't get much faster than F1. As a proof of concept for the retro engine, Australian developer Christian Whitehead, better known as the Taxman, ported Sonic 3 to mobile. It was never intended to be released, and as of writing, Sonic 3, in its original form, has never been re-released. Though, with the upcoming release of Sonic Origins, that is soon to not be true. At some point, Sonic briefly appeared in Angry Birds Epic, and was basically just a reskin of the Yellow Bird. I knew literally nothing about this, and there appears to be very little information related to it. They put him in for a limited time event, that is all. Keep Up was an unreleased song by rapper Juice World, originally intended to be used in the 2020 Sonic movie. The song was never finished due to his unfortunate death in 2019, and was reworked into the movie's current credits theme. Sonic Central Today is a news outlet Sega uses to announce new Sonic-related content, but back in the mid-2000s, it was a dedicated website. It didn't seem to have lasted that long, as it appears to have gone defunct sometime in 2008. Trying to dig up results on the Wayback Machine did little to nothing. Today, it'll just redirect you to the main Sonic the Hedgehog website. This could refer to a few different statues. There's one of these in a forest in Japan that was recently restored, the fragments of the statue that sat outside Sega World Sydney in Australia, as well as these two Sonic and Knuckles statues that were also from Sega World Sydney. Back in the late 90s, a toy company called Resaurus made Sonic action figures for Sonic Adventure. There were two waves of the toys released. 
with the second wave mainly featuring some different packaging. The third wave, however, I can't find any information for. It was supposedly to be based on Sonic Adventure 2, but seeing as how the company was folded, they never released. A beta version of Sonic 2, now known as the Nick Arcade beta for obvious reasons, was shown on an episode of the show Nick Arcade. Sonic 2 has a very long and complicated history with prototypes, mainly just from the unprecedented amount that have been made public. There's plenty of noticeable differences, but there's just too much to talk about with these. A Sonic manga based off the games was briefly printed in Basatsu Korokoro Comic Special, a magazine targeting elementary schoolers between 1992 and 1994. The comic revolves around Nicky, basically Sonic's Clark Kent, down to the glasses and everything, and his misadventures of not really being able to deal with the bad guys harassing his girlfriend Amy and subsequently turning into Sonic whenever he's in trouble, though he never actually knows it. Unfortunately, a majority of the comics have disappeared into the ether, leaving countless gaps in the story for anyone who wants to read through it, which would be a slim number anyway, because the entire thing is in Japanese. It's a shame, really, because the art style is really interesting, and though it's mainly for younger audiences, it seems like it would be a really fun read, and many of the characters were never seen again outside of publication. Apparently, Miyamoto once stated that he wanted to put Sonic and Mario Kart Double Dash for GameCube. I can't find any information on this topic other than a Did You Know Gaming video. It might have been something, it may have been nothing. Either way, it never ended up happening. R2, so far as I can tell, refers to a cut level from Sonic CD. Exactly what the R and R2 means isn't exactly obvious until you look into the game files. The R stands for round and is the game's way of categorizing the zones. For example, Palm Tree Panic is round one, and from that, you would think Collision Chaos would be round two, right? Well, no. Collision Chaos is referred to as round three in the files. Strangely enough, it's not present in the December 1992 beta discussed earlier, meaning it was cut very early on. Only a few enemy assets and a single concept sketch still exist, meaning we have next to nothing to go on as to what this zone may have originally been. In the late 90s, websites advertising Sonic Adventure for the Sega Dreamcast were made available to browse. And believe it or not, they're still up today. There are two in particular, an English one and a Japanese one. The Japanese site is a bit more interesting to me, but the English site has some interesting stuff as well, though there are a lot of dead links. It's honestly fascinating these websites are still up to begin with. I couldn't recommend more going through and browsing them. They're honestly really cool. Links in the description. As many people know, Archie used to print the Sonic comic right up until their license to do so ran out. The main issue with that being they were right in the middle of a sub-series based on the Genesis games. Only two issues were ever released, and the rest were cancelled. Which is a shame, since we'll never really get to know where the plot was going. On the flip side, IDW is doing a pretty bang-up job with the series so far and I genuinely can't wait to see what they'll give us next. Alton Towers is a theme park in the UK. Why is this notable to the list? Because of the Spinball Wizard ride. Initially, when it opened, the ride was loosely themed after Pinball Wizard by The Who, though in 2010, as part of a partnership with Sega, it was given a Sonic-themed rebranding, along with their hotel featuring a Sonic-themed suite, all to advertise the upcoming release of Sonic 4 Episode 1. The sponsorship continued up until 2016, when it lapsed, and the ride was taken back to its original theme. Sonic Cafe was a mobile game service that ran from 2001 to 2007, exclusively in Japan and only for NTT Docomo's iApply phones, though a select few of these games were brought to the US and Europe. 
A good amount of these games are entirely unremarkable, just some early Java phone games. Though the grand majority of these games are lost and are subsequently unplayable. Sonic Adventure 7 is a bootleg for the Game Boy Color. It's a hack of an earlier bootleg game called Sonic 3D Blast 5 from 1997. It was hacked into a few other games. Sonic Adventure 8 in 2000, Pokemon Adventure also in 2000, and Pokemon Jade in 2001. Don't ask me why they changed properties out of nowhere. The game plays like ass, looks like ass, and sounds like ass. Avoid it at all costs or buy it as a shelf piece, see if I care. Sega apparently really liked doing toy deals with fast food chains, because who oh boy are there a lot of them. In the UK, Burger King got two sets of toys, one in 1993, probably based on Sonic 2, and one from 1998 based on Sonic R. There was going to be a third set in 1999 based on Sonic Adventure, however, it was cancelled, but not before concepts were drawn up. Back in the 2000s, Flash games were everywhere, and though it may be dead today, there are still ways to play these games. Back in the day, Sega released a few Flash games on the internet. These generally were nothing special, just some unrelated puzzle game rebranded to be used as an ad for whatever game was coming out at the time. Innovations is a museum in Disney World's Epcot. Sega started sponsoring a large space in 1994, and would continue to do so until 2001. In the space, they featured many of their games for the Genesis, Saturn, Arcade, and Dreamcast. It's weird to think that not too long ago, Sega had a giant advertisement in Disney World, and it's not hard to imagine many people got their first experiences with the company's games during this period. Sonic Awakening was a proposed sequel to Sonic 06. You can probably already tell why this game never happened. The actual plot remains unknown, and why it was cancelled should be obvious. The only reason we know it existed at any point is the fact that it was listed on the credits for Pete Capella, voice actor for Silver from 2006 to 2009. Voice recordings were possibly done, but nothing has ever been made public. It's also possible that this may have just been a beta for Sonic Unleashed, but considering nothing has ever been said about it, we may never know. Sonic Synergy, to put it bluntly, was one of the original builds and title for Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric. There's not much to say here, it was a beta version of a game that arguably never left the beta stage. There's some unused voice clips, but that's it, other than the name change, which was done to more easily tie it in with the cartoon, comic, and everything else that came with it. Although I must say, I do like this logo a lot more than the one we actually got in the end. Sonic DS was a playable demo shown off at E3 2004. All you did was move the stylus left and right on the touchscreen to go faster. That's it. You can't really even call it gameplay. Sega didn't have anything else to show off for the DS in 2004, though E3 2005 would give us our first look at Sonic Rush. A lost, unaired pilot of the show Nick Arcade featured a beta of Sonic 1. It should be noted that both of these things were just recently rediscovered, and unfortunately, because Viacom are bitches, you can't watch the pilot anywhere on the internet. Though a beta, not unlike the one seen in the episode, was recently discovered, though there is speculation as to whether or not it is the same beta. Sonic R's soundtrack sucks, as does the rest of the game. Here's an actual clip of the song. I can't tell you where it came from, but that's it. It just ends abruptly at 28 seconds. Not to be confused with the earlier and more well-known Sonic Extreme, Sonic Extreme without a hyphen and spelled correctly 
was a skateboarding game developed for Xbox in 2003 by Visionscape Interactive, the company that handled Sonic Heroes' cutscenes. It was submitted to Sega, but when no response came, it was canned, though it may have served partial inspiration for Sonic Riders, which released just three years later. The Sonic OVA, or Original Video Animation, is an absolute cult classic. Loosely based on Sonic CD, it looks visually stunning, while also being a very fun watch. However, it didn't do very well back in the day, and the rights to the film have been split up between several different companies. Because of this fracturing, the soundtrack, one of the best parts of the film as a whole, has also had its rights split up. Meaning, we'll probably never get a complete soundtrack release, which, again, is a shame. To promote the forthcoming Japanese release of Shadow the Hedgehog for GameCube, Sega sent out a Shadow mascot to a wrestling match. Unfortunately, he didn't wrestle, rather he sat with the commentators after briefly going out in the ring. Even less fortunately, no footage of the event currently exists, so far as I know. Remember that Alton Towers entry a while back? Well. It wasn't the first time Sega had worked with the theme park. They also provided a Sonic statue for a dark ride called Toyland Tours, where it remained until the ride was reworked to have a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory theme in 2005. The statue itself has more than likely been destroyed. Sonic 16 was an unreleased spin-off game themed around the Saturday morning cartoon. The gameplay was nothing like any other title in the series, playing more like a stealth game, or at least that's what we see in the short demo footage. The game was shown to Sega, but it never got approved, meaning it was never developed. Okay, another callback. I already mentioned these, but here are the pictures again, along with this tail statue. No one knows where this one went. I know that doesn't sound good, but hear me out on this one. This simply refers to an internal demo cartridge containing seemingly cut music for Sonic 2. A few of the tracks can't really be placed, but it's neat this ever even went public at all. There were a few different pitches of the 2020 Sonic movie, though I can't find much other than these posters. Seriously, I just can't find what this is talking about. At one point, Sonic Generations was slated to release for the PSP. There's a few assets and not much else. I would wager this one didn't get too far in development, considering the name of the game at this point was still Sonic Anniversary, though if there was a finished build, I think it would look like the 3DS version. This is talking about one of two things. Either the original version of the intro, which was tonally very different from the final, which has long since been lost to history, or the intro from the original run of the first season, which was done in-house rather than outsourcing it to noisy neighbors. Strangely enough, there are sound effects present that are not in the redone season two intro. Of course, in all reruns and home releases, the old intro theme isn't present, making it somewhat of a rarity these days. As mentioned previously, Sonic has a bit of a history with mobile games. Before the iPhone and the like, phones did have games, but were made in Java. These were usually pretty simple games. There were some ports of older titles, as well as completely original games. A good amount of these have been preserved and are playable with Java emulators. Here, got a third game with Extreme in the title? Okay, so Sonic Extreme without a hyphen spelled correctly and with a capital R for GBA was another canceled skateboarding game. This time, it was to be a racing game featuring hoverboards. From the information we have, it barely had any time in development and was to be developed by Backbone Entertainment. The reason for its cancellation is also pretty dumb. Sega of Japan requested the game be, quote, more 3D, which was something that couldn't be done without delaying the game. 
Sonic Mars was an unreleased title originally intended to be released on the Sega 32X, but was moved to the Saturn and eventually became Sonic Extreme, the original one this time. From the limited amount of gameplay footage we have available, it does appear to have been a 3D platformer, albeit one with a more puzzle feel. The game would have seen Sonic enter a VR world called Micromobius in order to not only save his friends, some of which coming from the ABC cartoon series, but also save the world from being reformatted. Just taking a look at some of the gameplay footage, this no doubt would have pushed the 32X to its absolute limits, and is probably part of the reason why it was moved over to the Saturn. Like many shows, The Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog had a pilot episode, mainly as a proof of concept of the show itself to sell the idea to ABC's executives, though it was only ever shown at the initial proposal and was never aired on TV. Despite that fact, it was uploaded to the internet March 4th, 2009, which means unlike most cartoons, the pilot is still watchable in full to this day, as unpolished as it is. In fact, sound effects and music are completely absent. Though, for the most part, it would seem the plot of the show's first aired episode is simply a reworking of this unreleased pilot. Of course, it's the 90s. Everything had a live show, even video games. Live in Sydney is exactly what it sounds like. It was a live show at Sega World Sydney. The plot was very simple. Sonic 3 has just happened, and the Death Egg has just crashed in Aussie land, because of course it did. You could probably guess what happens from there. This explanation may seem rather bare bones, but that's because in the world of today, no pictures or footage of the live event have ever been made public. All we have to go on is a soundtrack CD, which may as well be the only proof this show ever occurred, so far as I know. As far as I'm concerned, only one piece of concept art of Sonic 3's ice cap zone actually exists, and from it, it appears very different. Everything appears to be made entirely of ice, and the level took place at night, meaning Sonic 3's day-to-night cycle in the backgrounds might have been more dramatic in this stage, or the entire stage was to take place at night, much like Carnival Night Zone. Late in development, Sonic Extreme threw out the fisheye lens bit and instead took a more traditional look for a 3D platformer. Of course, it was still never finished, and probably not long after these builds started development, the game was cancelled. Okay, this is literally a coincidence. You see, in the OVA, Sonic and Tails live together in a crashed plane on a floating island. And it just so happens that in this one particular shot, the plane's paint scheme becomes a near-dead ringer to the top half of the transgender pride flag. This almost certainly wasn't intended by the artists who worked on the film, but hey, what the hell, it's Pride Month. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's an ad for a pair of Sonic-themed shoes that happened to come from South Korea. The weird part comes from the fact that the ad appears to have been made by whatever studio Deke had contracted to do the animation for the Saturday morning cartoon. If anything, it's just a neat little oddity, and not much more. Remember that Japanese website I mentioned earlier? Yeah, this is that. It discusses a few things related to the game's development, as well as cataloging the dev's trip to South America. It appears the site was active until sometime after the game released, and as previously stated, the site is still accessible to this day. Seriously, it's a trip. Check it out. Apart from sounding like fanfiction, Sonic the Shadow World was a failed 2005 pitch for a PSP game. It was to take place in the aforementioned Shadow World, and was considerably darker in tone than any other game in the series at that point. Now, of course, parts of the plot would conflict with Shadow's backstory and the like, but there really doesn't seem to be too much to go on here since, as stated, the pitch was never green-lighted. Ah yes, another live show from Sega World Sydney. This time, however, we have pictures, but not much else. 
It feels like an extremely watered-down version of an Adventures episode, with Robotnik trying to create a robot that'll once and for all defeat Sonic and that not going well. There's even less information on this one than the costume show mentioned earlier, but as I've said, we actually have pictures. The Sonic series has a long history of using buses to advertise itself, going as far back as 1990. This is no different. All it is is an advertisement for the 2006 game, but encapsulating the exterior of a bus. I know that's not much to go on, but that really is all this is. Treasure Tales is another cancelled game, this time featuring Sonic's twin-tailed little buddy. It was to be an isometric puzzle platform adventure game. The game was pitched for the Sega Genesis in February 1993, but was rejected. Though surprisingly, the VHS tape containing the images for the pitch was preserved and leaked to the internet August 17th, 2020. This one isn't a game but it could most certainly be found in arcades. Sega Sonic Cotton Candy Machine is just as advertised, a cotton candy dispenser, but with a Sonic theme. Like an earlier popcorn dispenser, there was a short mini game that could be played while waiting, though there's no actual footage of it, assuming it was ever mass produced, as I've only been able to find two pictures related to it. That, and an OC someone made inspired by it on clipartkey.com. I know it's a trend nowadays on the internet to make fake anti-piracy screens of games, but I promise you, this time, it's real. The game will check to see if it's being run on an official GD-ROM disc and not a burned CD. If the check fails, your current character will fall through the ground of a given level, rendering it unplayable. This cannot happen on emulators, not even with a pirated copy. Like anything traditionally animated, the Sonic OVA had copious amounts of animation cells, containing every single frame of the film. Of course, for the studios, these were nothing more than tools, and once their use was up, the majority were destroyed. Nowadays, any surviving cells are extremely rare and exceedingly valuable. They are, in fact, so rare that almost no images of them actually exist. That is, of course, if there are any left. In fact, the only real clean images we have of any of these cells are from Japanese phone cards. Weirdly enough, one of these cards depicts a frame not seen in the film. For the uninitiated, Sonic Schoolhouse was an educational game released on PC in 1996, and if it seems at all familiar, it's because it was the main inspiration for that one indie horror game I won't talk about. Anyway, the game has a bug where if the sound system doesn't work correctly, an error message will pop up. And if you click the go button as quickly as possible, the game will send you to an unused test room. Christian Whitehead, naturally, didn't start off just working with Sega to officially port older games. For a long time, he was very active in the fan game community. Sometime around 2005, he created a 3D test game, and it went mostly unknown until May 31st, 2021, when Twitter user Snick posted that a friend of theirs had somehow found the game and that it had been archived. Whitehead replied later the same day, saying he had forgotten he made it, and clarified it was made using C++ and the Direct3D7 API. The game itself feels very janky to control, the momentum is very weird, and clipping into the level geometry is exceedingly easy. However, it was a test game, and Whitehead's first experience in developing in 3D. Sonic 1 would have felt right at home on the Commodore Amiga, being a 16-bit home computer and one that was immensely popular in Europe, it only made sense that the newest smash hit franchise in 16-bit gaming would one way or another find its way to the platform, along with supposed ports to the Atari ST, Commodore 64, and ZX Spectrum. A port was briefly worked on by US Gold, and seemingly got far enough for Ace Magazine to have some screenshots, but it was ultimately never released due to complications between the two companies. Sonic Jam contained some unused content related to Sonic and Knuckles, as well as some sound effects from other games. Ah. Ah. There's not much to Sonic Jam for Gamecom, it's just awful. 
if you thought Movie Sonic looked bad before the redesign, well, have a look at this. <laughs> yeah, so at CinemaCon 2019, Paramount revealed an early trailer for the movie and... Well, yeah, it looked like this. Yeah, I know a lot of people were a bit iffy about this movie, but honestly, I think it turned out just fine. I don't like this. I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this. Sonic has a long history with mascot costumes. A good amount of them were great, others were not. This one just makes me unwell. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the soulless, empty eyes staring off into the distance. This man has seen some shit in his day. Can we go back? Please, for the love of God, go back. Go back! We've gone too far, go back! Ah, much better. At one point, close to its launch, Sonic 3D Blast was planned to release on the Tiger Gamecom. The only proof we have of this is a screenshot included in a promotional booklet bundled with the Gamecom itself. We can only assume it was going to play like any other version of the game, albeit far, far choppier. Again, it's on Gamecom. How could it not be shit? You can probably guess why this one closed. Although not located in Akuma or Futaba, Sega World Tomioka and the Fukushima Prefecture opened sometime in the 1990s and remained open until the Fukushima nuclear disaster of 2011 forced the venue to close. The building still stands today, although abandoned, with many arcade units left behind, much like the town of Tomioka itself. Although most of the town had its evacuation order lifted in 2017, the northeastern areas of the town are still off limits, over a decade later. Sonic Riders was planned to release for the GBA around the same time as the other versions of the game. The game was planned to use an engine akin to that of OutRun. Much like Sonic Extreme, spelled correctly without a hyphen and a capital R, the game was cancelled because Sega of Japan wanted it to be more 3D, which couldn't be done in the limited time slot. Only a single asset from the game exists. A looping animation of a checkered flag. Meg Ing Lima is an American voice actress who provided the voice work for Sonic Schoolhouse. Strangely enough, Schoolhouse appears to be her only credit as a voice actor. No images of Ing Lima exist on the internet. Of course, it could have easily been a pseudonym, but the fact that for over 20 years, no one has been able to answer the question of just who Meg Ing Lima is, leaving a bit of a mystery, albeit one the community isn't particularly quick to answer. And that is it. That is the entire image beginning to end. I've probably messed up a few details here and there, and there's probably some things that I missed, but whatever, that's what the comment section is for. I might do a follow-up video if there's enough information to explain. If not, there might just be a pinned comment or something. I don't friggin' know. It's YouTube, whatever. You can like and subscribe if you want. I won't force you. Anyway, this video has gone on for way too long. I'm, I'm gonna go to sleep now. See you later.